Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to uh, TV and film, the new El Dorado session. So for the next uh, 50 minutes, 50 minutes or so, we will endeavour to give you our views about some of the challenges and the opportunities that are confronting both the film and the TV industry. So joining me this afternoon on my far right, Amadeen Cassie, Director of International Research at Europa Data TV Worldwide. Michael Ut, hopefully I've got that right, Michael, who's the executive producer, uh, but also one of the co-founders of Trevana, one of Sweden's preeminent film and TV production companies. <coughs> On my left here, we have Philip Krauser, who is a man of actually, I found out this morning, of many titles and many roles at Bavaria Film. Uh, but he is wearing the hat this, uh, this afternoon as the head of co-production and financing. And last but not least, from the world of finance, we have David Grosvenor from ING, BV Bank in Holland. Um, so uh, each of the panelists will give us a presentation. I will ask some questions after they have finished. Uh, and then probably the last 15 minutes of the session today, we will open the room up for uh, everybody for, for questions. So without further ado, uh, I would like to ask Amadine to actually set the scene for us. Um, Give us some of the facts behind some of the trends that we're seeing. Let's understand the landscape first before we have our discussion. So over to Amadine. Good afternoon, everybody. So first, uh, let me uh, give you a bit of context by uh, explaining who Eurodata TV is. Eurodata TV, this is 100 territories, more than 5,000 channels, and only one contact. We deliver all official TV ratings of any program broadcast on any channel in the world. We track our client rights thanks our metadata. And most of all, we provide with insight analysis based on a global expertise, whether it is about sports, kids, TV trends, drama formats, and even social and second screen strategies. In four words, we help to understand today to better prepare tomorrow. So speaking about understanding today, TV is doing well. Traditional TV is doing well. In 2012, the average daily viewing time uh, per individual was th three hours and 17 minutes a day, one minute more compared to uh, the previous year. Entertainment represents the majority of the best performing programs in more than 70 countries, followed by fiction and factual. And within fiction, movie stand for 13%, while series represent more than 60%. In all genres, the local takes center stage, especially in, so in movies, for instance, where local movies represent more than half of best performing movies. And that's even more significant with uh, series, as the three quarter are local uh, series among the best performing ones. The offer of local series is, uh, depends from one country to another and even from one broadcaster to, uh, to another. And in prime time, for instance, in, uh, in the UK, they represent more than 40% uh, percent of the schedules, while only 7% in Sweden. But everywhere, uh, the local series are the most watched. For instance, in Denmark, 10% of the series aired in prime time are local and they stand for 45% of the series watched in this slot. So the Scandinavian uh, models show that um, the, the success of local offer, even a modest one, is the first step toward international recognition. And this is precisely a Scandinavian co-production, The Bridge, which is one of the most emblematic illustrations of the global resonance of the European output. So the bridge was uh, broadcast in different countries in Europe, specifically in uh, the UK or in the Netherlands and also in Germany. In the UK and in the ne Netherlands, it was broadcast in its original subtitled version. If that's quite a standard in uh, Holland, this is very new in, uh, in the UK. And yet, the bridge uh, augmented by three, the BBC4 slot average. In addition to the original version, 
the series was adapted twice. First, this summer on FX, where the premiere uh, reached an average audience four times higher uh, than the slot average. And in the US, uh, still on FX, the series also broke records in terms of DVR playback, doubling the young adult audience after the, fir the first broadcast within the week after the first broadcast. The second adaptation is uh, expected this fall on uh, Sky Atlantic and, uh, and Canal Plus, as this is a French Anglo-French co-production, and it premiered here uh, yesterday evening. Other European series follow the same track, such as the German The Last Cop, which was broadcast in its original dubbed version from Quebec to Italy, and was ad adapted earlier this year with a decent success in prime time for TF1. In UK, Broadchurch was a huge hit uh, last March on ITV, and since then has been critically acclaimed uh, in different parts of the world, from Sweden to Canada and uh, till uh, Australia. The French Les Revenants, also known as Rebound or The Returned, has been broadcast in its original subtitle version uh, on Channel 4. Uh, it was a premiere in two decades for the broadcaster. And Sundance will do the same at the end of this month. These three series will be adapted for the US market, meaning a potential global resonance even more significant, as illustrated before with uh, Atufi, also known as Homeland, or uh, The Killing for instance. As far as feature films on television are concerned, the offer is uh, clearly smaller than series, but is slightly and st steadily rising in the big five European countries on free to air channels. And globally, the movies uh, hours watched are bigger than movies broadcast hours on television. If we look at some specific countries in Europe, Overall, the, the offer of feature films on television is stable and slightly increases in Italy, and the viewing decreases in the UK and Denmark, while it remains stable in Germany and Italy. Uh, if we uh, have a look at the top one entertainment and top one series in these countries, we can see that they draw in massive audience, while movies draw in, on average, half the entertainment and series uh, audiences. But that's not quite uh, surprising, because uh, entertainment and series have been specifically made for television, while television is the last step in movies' uh, life cycle, after theater, uh, SVOD, VOD, DVD, and pay TV. So, the, the more the TV production is strong, uh, the less uh, movies attract massive audience in, uh, in, uh, on, on free television, on free to air channels. So let's now see two examples where the figures speak for themselves. So in France, for instance, comparing the 100 best performing programs in 2008 and 2012, we can see that in 2008, the number one shows was a French movie. Uh, with more than 11 million viewers. In 2012, it has been replaced by the long-standing uh, long variety charity show, Les Enfoirés. And in a fragmented market at a time where um, audience erosion became, becomes the rule, it is uh, important to notice that the number one in 2012 gained two million viewers compared to four years ago. In the meantime, movies fall, fall, fell back by four points, with Gran Torino being the number one movie. TV fiction remains stable with a larger proportion of series, and France remains an exception with uh, US series doing better than the national ones. Overall, entertainment formats uh, step up by three points. In Spain, the picture is very different. Uh, in 2012, the, lo the local series Aguila Roja replaced the Eurovision as number one uh, shows, in, but with one third less uh, viewers. Overall, series step back by five uh, points, which can be explained uh, first because of some series have been cancelled, such as Escenas de Matrimonio or Camera Cafe. And in the meantime, Telecinco's flagship series, Aida, lost its main character, Aida. 
and at the same time, a large part of its audience. And the movie took advantage of this loss uh, because for, uh, in, on Sunday evening, movie slot faces Aida. And the, the movie slot take, uh, t took the disappointed, gained the disappointed viewers from, uh, from the series, which helped movies to rise in the top ranking. Also in 2008, news uh, represents 17% of the top 100 uh, programs because of the election. So movie also replaced news in the top ranking in 2012. So at a time where the competition has never been so strong, standing out is essential. And one way to stand out is A-list tenants, even if it is not a 100% guarantee of success. The most important thing remains to provide viewers with thrilling stories, bold content, and something different of what can be expected. But among series that uh, managed to secure a large audience, the following, starring Kevin Bacon, Bacon um, uh, made an impression in, uh, in the UK on Sky Atlantic, especially with uh, young adults. Still in the UK, Jane Campion's Top of the Lake started very strong on BBC Two and overall drew in an audience 10% up the slot average. Netflix Orange is the New Black by, the, by Wits creator and starring uh, Jason Biggs from American Pie, was renewed for a second season even before the first one was available on the SVOD service. And on traditional television, it, made also, uh, it caused a stir, uh, especially with uh, young adults in uh, New Zealand on TV2. Steven Spielberg's Under the Dome is a new global hit uh, it boosted largely CBS average share and is reaching a global success from Australia uh, to Spain. The first season uh, was available on Amazon and the second will also be available on Amazon. And finally, premiering last week, uh, Robin Williams, um, The Crazy One, became season's number one new series with 4.5 million viewers. Overall, A-list tenant can be also a safer bet for advertisers. Um, with a solid fan base for Stephen King and uh, Steven Spielberg, international, international audience instantly fell for uh, Under the Dome, and the TV ad spends follow appropriately. So for instance, in the ProSieben in Germany, uh, ProSieben prior to the launch of Under the Dome, broadcast a US sitcom block with How I Met Your Mother and New Girl. The TV ad spends based on gross value for this US sitcom block were 1.6 million euros for an average audience of 1.4 million viewers. For its two hour premiere under the dome, a TV ad spends were 2.3 million euros and the audience double the, more, more than double the slot average. In the UK, comparing with the season's premiere of Big Brother and uh, The Walking Dead, um, under the dome increased by 29% and 11% the TV ad spends. So in a nutshell, traditional TV keeps on growing and TV is still the only media able to set unmissable rendezvous for engaging experience. Local content is king, wherever the, whatever the genre, and the local success leads to worldwide recognition. A-list talent and bold dramas generally pay off and traditional key players uh, are, um, and new entrants are opening the way to a new and fruitful partnership. Thank you very much for your attention. And now, let's discuss. So, Amadine, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, each of our, our panelists will, um, uh, will speak. Uh, but before doing that, uh, just maybe a couple of questions. Um, obviously, traditional uh, broadcast TV it's not dead, um, you know, thanks to local content. Um, but I guess what you didn't cover in that is, uh, I guess the viewers, is how are they consuming content? So first they consume it on the main TV screen, but also on uh, other screen. And uh, in catch up first also, for instance, in, uh, in the UK, uh, Bob No Measures um, Life plus 28 days after the first broadcast. And we can see, for instance, that the series, the drama series, Luther, doubled uh, its uh, audience uh, in mm -hmm. uh, the months after the first broadcast. 
So we have different measures, not a one uh, unique measures for all the way to watch uh, television. Right. But we have leads that tell us that uh, the TV content is even more watched than we know today, thanks to mm -hmm. the TV measurement. Right. And, and also, uh, one of the other trends that we've seen, obviously, with um, uh, Scandinavian drama or drama formats coming out of other <laughs> markets, such as uh, Israel, um, I was surprised to see Turkey and India also on that, that chart. Does that mean that content is starting to, uh, some of their, their content or some of the formats are starting to travel outside of the originating market of India and Turkey? Uh, absolutely. In uh, Eastern Europe, especially uh, Turkish and Indian series, telenovela, are, uh, are making impression, uh, especially mm -hmm. in Bosnia or Croatia. And uh, while uh, big US series are still well exported worldwide, but now um, channels are also looking for alternative to the US content. Right. And this is something different. That's why I say the most important thing is to provide something that is not obviously expected. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Turkish drama are uh, upgrading uh, and uh, they are getting better and better right. over the last uh, years. And the uh, Indian series, that's quite new. So let's see what uh, will happen mm -hmm. uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few years. And do you have a sense of where the, those Indian series are, are playing outside of India? Um, Any data to, to show us that? So, uh, excuse me. Where the Indian shows are now playing internationally uh, beyond in their own borders. In Eastern Europe, they are. In Eastern doing Europe. Yeah, doing very well. Kay. And also in uh, Emirates. Okay. They're doing That's well great. Too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, obviously, I'd, I'd like now to uh, really turn to um, Michael, for really Michael to uh, share with share with us his perspective. I mean, we've seen an incredible global success in recent years of uh, Scandinavian films and, uh, and uh, TV drama. Um, and what I'm really in interested to hear about, you know, what, what has been his experience and how is the business changing your production company? So, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I am that local content guy. From Sweden. Um, I'll tell you shortly about Trevenor. It was founded in 1995 by three screenwriters, and I'm one of them. Uh, we just came off a sitcom and decided to try to control the process and wanted to become producers. Uh, we have focused from the start on scripted film and TV, and we were very early adapters on the co-production with uh, the early Valander series with Rolf Laskord that we did with SVT and ZDF. Um, since this October, we're part of Svensk Film Industry. So, you know, with that muscle, we hope to be able to expand our business even more. Well, the Scandinavian model, in my view, and this is a very Swedish perspective, because I think the Danish perspective is a little different. Uh, we always had, we don't work in silos in Sweden, so there's always a cross-pollination between talent, between film and TV. So, for example, we did a movie called Easy Money with Daniel Espinosa, who then went on to make Safe House with Daniel, uh, Denzel Washington, and he also directed the first pilot in our Sebastian Bergman series. So we always have a lot of cross pollination between talent. We also f early financed through a film and TV slate. So one of our products were made for feature film, and five or six or four were made for TV, so we could access some more financing. In the beginning, it was all about book rights, and really simply it was about rights that worked in Germany. Henning Mackel, Joval Wale, Beck. And then the really exciting thing has happened in the last couple of years, where it's like, you know, the bridge is that we're moving into original programming. And, and also the secret has been we've also been having a long-term relationship with one or two lead broadcasters, in my case, mostly SVT or TV4 and ZDF. I think the challenges ahead is are many, and the opportunities are many. But thing that I always want to bring up is something that I never thought about when I started this. It's actually the format, the length of the show. Because we don't really have a standard. We have a 58-minute public broadcaster in Sweden. We have a 90-minute slot in Germany. We have a 44-minute. In It's really a complicated thing with co-productions when you have to do different versions. So you have to have, you know, addressing that issue. It's a complication that really spends a lot of time on. And also we have the closed episode, which is like the one-off procedural 
or the open-ended. And I think to me the trend is clearly towards the open-ended, long-running series where you can really attract the viewers. And that's something we, you know, we talk a lot about. And then it's, of course, the digital revolution or disruption or how new players from Netflix and VOD are, you know, affecting our financing and, and really moving our audience around. And this is what I'm bringing here. And I just wanted to bring this up because I think it's interesting. Two years ago, I would be here with a lot of books from Sweden. There's not one book here. There's one series that I'm, me and Hans Rosenfeld, the creator of The Bridge, has created called Deja Vu. We have one, I would call a spin-off from our Easy Money with one of the stars from Easy Money. It's Alex. It's a hard-hitting crime series. We have a thing called The Grey Zone, which we're developing with the Cosmo film in Denmark, which is our you know, belief that to do true co-production, we should start at this organic start, so it's something we develop together. It's our homeland meets uh, the bridge. And we have The Stone, which is, for us, a venture. It's a crime story, but with a more supernatural tone and more drama, still the realism of Scandinavia, but with a little more edge. And none of them are based on books, and that's really the, one of the big changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. So, um, I guess that working, working across film and television, there, there are lots of different models that you, you must employ. So, how do you figure out which is the best model for which project? Well, it takes a lot of um, thinking, but I really think that the, film, the feature film market is changing so much because TV is so strong. A couple of years ago, you could really take you know, a, a crime story mm -hmm. and move it into the feature film. And that has all changed, because rationally, as the audience realizes, hey, I can watch great stuff on TV at 9 o'clock, you know, the feature film really right. has to be spectacle or very driven stories or have something uniqueness. Uh, and, and to me, that really is you know, the story. Is it a feature film story mm -hmm. or is it a, 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 a TV? And so the answer for me is it's all about the stories. Right. You know. Right. How, does, how do we engage short-term or long-term? Mm -hmm. And your traditional broadcast partners, I mean, how um, adaptable, how flexible are they now, do you think, in terms of, of co-producing, co-financing? Co and as you mentioned, you know, Netflix coming into the market, there are going to be more, more players. The how, how's the game going to change? Well, it's, we're in the middle of it, so I don't really know the end of right. it, but I, I can clearly say that... I think that the Scandinavian broadcasts have been very early on, on adapting, so I think we have very good broadcasters. I think that it's clear, it, in the end, I mean, it's the legal work on the holdbacks is, is mm -hmm. turning into, you know, wh who has what holdback, what, you know, screening. So I really can't really answer that question. I think it's a game that we're being played right now, and, and, and somehow I think the Netflix position has moved from being, you know, that position to that position to that position, and nobody mm -hmm. really knows where it's going to end up. Yeah, and do you see that they're going to be greater partnerships moving forward? Do you think there's a necessity for partnership? I would say necessity. Yeah, you know, I mean, a necessity because of the cost of production is, is increasing? Well, I mean, one thing that's so striking to me is that the quality mm -hmm. has to increase, mm. whereas the, amount, the, the money that can be paid is probably going to get less. So we have mm. an equation that means we have to increase quality at the lower cost, which means yep. that somewhere we have to find more partners because more people have to pay for that quality. Right. Yeah. Michael, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the uh, German market. And uh, Philip, who's been an executive producer and a financer of a large number of feature films and TV series, um, he's head of uh, co-production and co-financing at Bavaria Film. Thank you. OK. Business is booming, new financial models. If I knew the new financial model, I wouldn't be here probably. <laughs> I would just use it myself. But um, I'm uh, um, quickly about Bavaria Film. I'm, uh, I'm uh, a producer. We produce a lot of television for local television, telenovelas, TV movies, series for the public and the private broadcasters. We also do teach feature films and do sales. I myself have produced feature films and television. I'm also, I was also ch in charge of TV sales for three years. So um, uh, we know we've, we've already talked about the market and uh, uh, had a good presentation here. So I'll be, I'm going to talk about the market, what I think is the, the opportunities are and the challenges. 
um, the market, I'll, I'll do that brief because we know we're short in time. We know that worldwide television audience, they have um, never been so high with the daily viewing terms increasing. The, there are more TV sets, more distribution, more channels, and non-linear availability of content, and overall better contents that drive uh, TV consumption. The digital ecosystem is actually helping the TV usage, and uh, the audience, and this is, this is the, the groundwork which has been broken by many of the series, uh, especially coming from Scandinavia. I mean, you must say Germany is basically one of the biggest financiers of, of, of the Scandinavian series, and it's been, a, it's been really, really, next, this collaboration between the German, German and Scandinavian broadcasters has really brought European fiction production far forward because it, bro it broke also ground for, for our productions to, uh, and, and, the and the broadcasters to take bigger risks, to take better, b bigger risks and, uh, and uh, looking at serialized formats and so on and so forth. So um, obviously they're the new players in the market. Um, there's a stronger, stronger pay TV platforms and VOD platforms, the, Heli the Netflixes, Hulus, and Amazon, they're all looking for original content and they compete with the established platforms. And this diversi diversification of choice leads to a higher demand of programming, which creates audience loyalties and engagement. And those are the two biggest, biggest, biggest things w coming from sales and production. My experience is what are broadcasters looking for? If I sell, they look for something which engages loyalties. It means volume, yeah? cheap and volume. Or they're looking for something spectacular, which can create and, and engage uh, the audience with their, with their brand and steer that, uh, the, the audience to the platform. So it's, it's really, in general things, it's really about, it's really about that. If you're in sales, local, uh, uh, local cheap, cheap in volume, or, or the um, high um, profile um, uh, uh, drama content. And all of this has led um, to, um, to new openness for, for non-local content. This has been mentioned before. The broadcasters, um, they do need to leverage the risks as the budget gets tighter. So they, they are trying to seize the opportunities to produce world-class projects, um, which are on air in multiple territories and resonating with the local audiences. So the challenges. The challenges for us as producers is obviously to have the right content for the market. And here we have, of course, the local, the local, the local production, the cheap and volume, which I which I mentioned, which is also local. We are we are producing a telenovela, Storm of Love, which is sold in 23 territories, going on for five years, and we have 25 percent market share. But it's a brand we very much nurture. It keeps it's it's German, but it, we we sell it really well. And then next to that is the premium content. So when you talk about the premium content. Obviously, it's all about creating um, uniqueness, a unique, a unique program with a unique selling point. And there we are facing in the broadcasters. That's something everyone says, OK, I want to do the no, I, my plan would be to do the new, do the, the new homeland. But we are still facing a risk averse decision making in, within the broadcasters. I mean, they are willing to take certain risks, but for us as producers, the really the challenge is to provide the safety lines for the decision makers to reassure them making the choice. In sales, as I said before, they, 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 they buy what's tried and tested. So we have to attach something. It's not only the great idea. We have to attach talent. We have to attack, attach a director and, or a network approved showrunner. We're developing a series. And it's really hard to um, uh, a spy series. And the spy series, it's, uh, they're all asking us, um, the network, so who is your showrunner? Is it a US showrunner? Who, who, who's who's going who's gonna to run the show? unless it's based on a best-selling novel. So you need to attach something else to the idea in order to break the ground, reassure, um, uh, reassure the, the ones, the decision makers in the broadcasters. So the producers are facing a big development risk, and that's the, that's the challenge. So what's been said before, that we need, you need partners in development early, really early. Uh, and it's somehow we're following a trend which we know from, uh, from, from feature films in a way. I mean, co-production may not be the solution for everything because we still have, in as we've seen, local, local fiction still works really well. But uh, once you tackle these, these uh, uh, high, high budget original dramas, you really need to, find, to start early development and find um, partners in 
TV, sales, also sales companies, they are in the business who get early um, to uh, uh, co-finance the development slate and partner with others at an early stage. So we also have to be more, um, more flexible in, in structuring our financing deals, similar, similar to, doing to doing feature films. And one, one interesting point, and maybe we can talk about it also later, is how we secure uh, from the production side, first, our revenues, because if we deal with two or three big partners, basically, there's not much left. We maybe end up, uh, we end up with a producer's fee, and the back end is a real back end. So there's really, there's really a question what, what remains for the, for the producer, because the biggest thing we have is access to talent and creativity. But we have to face we have to face a market in, which is changing, and we know that uh, uh, even if my show is on, on five or six non-exclusive VOD platforms, that each VOD platform is paying quite little. So, and then there's five intermediaries. What what comes back to me? So as a producer, so that is that is that is the big the big challenge for me. Next to the production risks, because I know the big shows they cost a lot of money. And basically, we have to finance them together with the different territories, just like we used to do feature films, or we're still doing feature films. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. So a, a number of questions: Are we really truly seeing convergence of the theatrical film business and uh, and TV drama? In in, I would say say yes. I would say yes in a, in a sense when you when you it's a challenge for 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 successful or established mm -hmm. uh, talent theatrical talent to to tackle the television world because you don't have you don't have the ninety minutes you know to to tell a story but you have that's the beauty of the long series you have a long series to tell and that that is a that is a creative challenge um, uh, for the for the for the creatives at the same time also you always in theatrical we know i mean you always fa face the the bottleneck of distribution, whereas in television, you know, if, you, if it goes well, you have a huge audience mm -hmm. immediately. That's very rewarding. Interesting, when I was talking about this this morning, it's like, um, when you think about for drama, in, in drama, theatrical goes on television. Interesting now, if you look at soaps and comedies, at least in Germany, it's, the, it's even more the other end around. We know that comedies are more local. Yeah? Soaps is all very local programming. But it's actually there. It's it's actually going the other way around. It's like right. you do a series and then you do a very it's very successful theatrical film. So it's really this is why I mean it's you mm -hmm. you, asked, you pointed the question right. It's about drama, and mm -hmm. there I said yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, you you've produced both films, TV series, cross board here in Europe, but also you've you've worked with North American partners. Um, what's your, been your experience working with with North American partners that perhaps aren't um, as I'm fay with uh, distribution with broadcast in, in the European landscape. What's your experience working with North American? Um, I've, I've had good, good experience. I mean, it's, it's like in any corporation, you have to sort of mm -hmm. share, share the same vision, you know, say you uh, be clear about the writers, uh, uh, the creative talent mm -hmm. behind it. And um, they're very curious. I mean, you see, I mean, it's, it's when I've been, since I've been going to, to Cannes and to the MIPCOMs, it's, uh, I've seen, it's, it's, I've never seen so many feature film and also American feature film producers uh, being at MIPCOM. So, mm. so and my, ex my experience is they're very curious. They see that there's creativity coming from us, from Scandinavia, from Germany. We are important markets and we have to, we have to build on, on, on those relationships. And we know, I mean, Netflix is eventually coming to all different territories. You know, in Germany, Sky is working on a new VOD flow. So there's, there's, there's opportunity there, obviously, which American partners also want to seize. Mm -hmm. And we are talking to them. It's, but first, always about, about the content. Yeah? Right. Whenever something's located in Europe, you know, they, they, I think we are, we are in the front row. And who do you think is going to be better equipped um, to sort of find the new models, the new structures for the world that we're looking at going forward? Uh, who, who meaning producers? The, the or companies and um, product, primarily production companies. Um, I mean, we, you know, the industry for so long has had, you know, very, very well defined models. Um, we're sort of now looking at, at the paradigm being broken. Mm -hmm. um, we have to create these new models. So the question is, do you need to structure yourselves in, in, a, in a different way going forward? I think I think what the future is. Um, you need a certain structure to work in, mm. but you need. It's I think uh, the model of having 
individual creative units mm -hmm. yeah, which are pretty autonomous which which allow which are bankrolled you know uh, uh, by maybe a, with a development deal with a with a TV sales company or even with with a Netflix as whoever yeah because development is always the biggest the biggest risk yeah right. um, so so the future thing, if Obviously, it's all access to talent, you know. Also, the courage and the possibilities to nurture new talent, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's hard always to hear that, okay, where's mm -hmm. your as showrunner? Otherwise, you know, we, right. we don't really continue to talk. So the, the fact, the big challenge for us is to also build up our talent so that they work maybe with a US showrunner and next time they do their own show, as, as the Scandinavians have, have, done, have, done, mm -hmm. have done really yeah. well. So I think it's about small units who are fast, quick, creative, uh, and who are not too much lost in a big, in a big structure, but they have to have, they have, to have uh, a levy on, a, on development risk, and then once the, the project is there, then, then profit from the big structure. So I think it's all, it's all about content. So if you don't yeah. have those units, it's... And uh, of course, um, everyone's creative endeavors um, come, to very, come to very little um, obviously without the necessary funding. Um, so our last panellist, David Grover, uh, Head of Media Finance at ING Bank, is going to share with us his secrets of how we can extract more money from the banks. David. Oh, thanks, David. Um, when I saw the theme was uh, the new Eldorado, I, I thought, were we talking about... Um, the uh, the fabled city of gold, or were we talking about the 1992 UK series about British pensioners basking in the Spanish sun? Uh, <laughs> the future, yeah. gold. <laughs> Excellent, and, and I agree with Philip that um, the digital ecosystem has an overall positive effect. Um, but I'm also hearing from my clients in the industry, it's also a bit scary how fast the digital distribution world is uh, is evolving as well. So I want to address today. Um, the main theme is digital distribution, how financiers can work with people in this room to try and monetize uh, new, new rights channels as, as they become more prolific. So, but I want to start with an admonishment. And, and uh, that admonishment is, is a view expressed to me by a major studio executive, but I, I happen to share the view. So um, I, I will say it. And, and that is that um, I, I think producers now uh, are, in, are in the driver's seat, in the power seat, to take advantage of a very strong strategic position in digital rights. And you're not doing it. Uh, and, and, and I think that you, know, you should get your act together, and you can throw barbs at me later, but right now, get your act together in exploitation of these rights channels, because it's really, uh, I think, a, a short window before your customers uh, begin to be uh, tougher on you. Um, and, you know, I've seen firsthand in the industry uh, the challenges the industry is grappling with. You take for a free air TV example. You know, there's have and have nots in, in, this, in, in free to air, depending on if you have embraced uh, the new digital distribution landscape or you're, not, or you're trying to embrace it and you haven't figured it out yet. And, and I think it's also too simple to say that, that linear TV is... is is not dead, and I've seen the statistics. Ninety percent of, of of viewing is still is still a linear TV, but I think that sort of makes it too simple. When in fact, fifty percent of those people are carrying this while they're watching TV or a smartphone or doing some other sort of, of interacting on a, on a second screen. And so, uh, you know, financiers are here to help or try to help uh, you to monetize the, the value of your of your digital rights. So if we look to the world, uh, next slide, please. Oh, do, am I supposed to do that, or does someone else do it? We'll get, oh. we get the clicker for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I decided to be different and, and stay seated. So, um, so I thought we could look to the, to the world of, of film finance, given the, the theme of, of the panel sessions, and specifically to the, co uh, the concept of the film financing borrowing base. I don't know who's here in the audience is familiar with that concept from the world of film financing? I don't see any hands. Great, that means I can, oh, someone said yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, this kind of film slate financing was very popular for a while, then had its share of miscues. Um, if I think about some recent miscues in the past few years, you had uh, MGM, RHI, 
uh, at the moment, I Inverness Limited, which is formerly Morgan Creek International, where ING is a member of the banking syndicate. So not fun. Uh, the, 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 um, but I think this technique could even be more uh, applicable to the TV world because of the, some of the traits of TV, which I'll get to in a second. So this is like this will be a 30-second uh, film financing 101. I'll do my best. Uh, and this is what we call the film library borrowing base. And simply stated, the borrowing base is a currency against which you can borrow to fund new projects. And that currency is created from three main categories. The first is a receivable. And this could be as simple as a receivable from ma a major studio such as Warner Brothers, Universal. Uh, and that would get a very, that could get a, a very strong weighting depending on the credit quality of, uh, of the major studio. Then you have sales estimates. And this is an estimate provided by a sales agent or um, a major studio uh, based on their experience with similar projects, similar genres, et cetera. And that can get up to a 50% weighting. And then you have um, ultimates. Uh, ultimates is um, what, what I want to zero in on. And this is the projection of revenue to be earned on a film throughout its entire life cycle. You add these up, adjust for the weighting, you get the borrowing base. So uh, next slide. Oh, I have it now. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I can't multitask. So how, how, did this, how does this apply to the digital world? What I've tried to do is, is kind of rewrite these three categories for the digital world. Uh, uh, the first is receivables, and this is most intuitive for bankers and probably the easiest step to make, is bankers can finance a receivable, but now it's not a major studio. It's a, what I call an OTT distributor, which is a digital distributor. OTT means over the top. It means any kind of distribution that's non-traditional. Um, for example, Netflix, let's take Netflix, as of December 31st, they had nearly 6 billion of streaming content commitments, and that's only what they could count. There's more that they can't count, and that's a strong bo uh, borrowing currency. Um, I want to skip quickly to digital ultimates, which is really uh, where I w what I want to focus on, and that's the, idea, that's the idea that you can project the revenue of, of, of a TV show uh, or project the revenues earned on content through digital based on some kind of viewing history. That's simply stated, that's it. Uh, and I think this is especially applicable to a multi-screen series. I just wanted to give a small example of Breaking Bad. Um, let's say you uh, are a viewer who's purchased seasons one through four of Breaking Bad on iTunes. Season five comes out. Now, I, what I don't think I will hear is, you know what? I don't care about Jesse. Uh, he's a loser anyway. Uh, I think you're going to buy season five. A and I think that's something that we can, that sh we should be able to say some definitive things about and quantify. So I think, I think in summary, uh, in summary, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, this all requires these distributors to share data, like Netflix, iTunes, and I, I understand they're not so sharing. So I, I think that would be one thing we have to try and uh, convince them to share. These receivables, monetize them. There's lots of value there. Uh, domestic sales estimates, and I want to thank here Wendy Bernfeld from Right Stuff to educate me on this. They're not l largely non-exclusive, so you can sell these rights. You can sell to Netflix, then go to Love Film, then go to Domino's Pizza, then go to Target. I know it's small, but I, it should add up. Um, and 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 uh, you know, above all, who knows when we unlock the this data, what we'll find in this kind of new world of data mining, big data. There might be some correlations that surprise us, which we can monetize. Uh, and finally, you know, I think, you know, Ultimates is, is still a currency in the film world. Uh, let's make it, uh, try to make it a currency in the TV world. David, thank you. And um, I, you make a good point about the Ultimates, but I guess for me, you know, how flexible and adaptable are banks gonna get, going to be in the future with the uh, media landscape that y y you know, it's going to be difficult for us to necessarily define as sharply as perhaps we have done in the past. So it's all very well having the ultimate, but that's not necessarily the answer, surely. Well, um, I think bankers are largely known to be inflexible. <laughs> I, I think on the, spectrum, on the spectrum of bankers, I think I'm more of one of the flexible guys, but probably seem very inflexible to this audience, I don't know. But, but you know, I think, uh, I think, Philip, you had on your slide the risk-averse um, decision-making uh, paradigm, and that's something mm. we have to fight against and realize that if we stay here and try to finance the old model, 
yep. that we'll, we're going to lose. Yep. So the only way forward is the only way is to go is forward, uh, and and that just requires all us all to work together. And bankers try to not be so inflexible. Good, you all heard that. Okay, <laughs> we have witnesses. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you uh, to the panelists. Um, I'd like to uh, throw uh, questions. Well, questions from the room. Anybody have a question? We can, there we are. There's a lady over here in green. Can you tell us who you are, where you're from? Uh, my name is Joanne Levy. I'm from Canada. I uh, represent a production company in Manitoba called Buffalo Gal Pictures. Uh, we do animation and live action and movies and lots of co-production. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in the comment about um, leaving too much in the, in the way of digital rights um, on the table. And I'd like you to explain a little bit more about uh, uh, what digital rights you think we're, uh, we're, we're not being tough enough about because um, our experience is that uh, the broadcasters that we deal with are trying to scoop up as many of those rights as they possibly can. And it is extremely difficult mm -hmm. to uh, make headway. And uh, I'm not sure that we have as much leverage as you think we do. But uh, if we do, and there's a strategy, yeah. I'd <laughs> like you to tell me about it. Thank you. I guess that's directed to me. Oh. Is that directed to anybody in particular or everybody? It's, uh, our banker. Oh, our no. banker. <laughs> yeah, I, I think from, from what I see, I think you have, you're in the industry, so I think you know better. From an outsider perspective, it seems to me that you are leaving some things on the table. What I will say about uh, Netflix, um, and this was another comment made to me by a studio executive, he said, Netflix isn't isn't the enemy, it's, it's actually a lot of times our buyer of last resort, and they actually, um, if you, they go to a free to air uh, customer, and the free to air customer says, I don't want it, then they say, okay, I'll go to Netflix, all of a sudden they want it. Um, so I, I, I'm not answering your question directly, but, but I, I think that, uh, and also if you look at all the, all of the distribution channels being created, I mean, I was kind of, I wasn't aware that Domino's Pizza was creating uh, video on demand service or Walmart or Target or Sainsbury's. Um, and so I think it's those types of things that can help you to unlock, unlock more value. Is that answering or not convincing you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, I, l l let's see how it evolves. Yeah. Oh. Well, look, yes, Philip, right? please. My, my experience is, is, is the same, obviously the broadcasters, they want to take, because they're not, they're not, no one knows what's going to happen, they take all, as, max, as many digital rights as they can. So, but obviously there, it's, it's, I think regulation will play, will play at some point a role. If we get public financing, obviously, you know, the, the producers associations, they, there's one role for to, to retain certain rights. I think that is, that is also a solution to one way. Um, I like the comment that you know the, 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 those new co new new uh, companies that are obviously our partners. You know, I mean, if if, if I was doing a series for Netflix, I would be very happy mm -hmm. to do that. And the thing is, this is what to come back to your question. Say, what, how are you best fit to the to the digital world? I mean, obviously, for a producer, you cannot you cannot. I mean, mon to monitor monitor the monitorizing. <laughs> yeah, um, that's impossible. So I mean, I think it's the production unit should really focus on the production and the creativity, but then you need a structure which is actually not only collection, but it gets, it gets goes beyond that. You know, you need to have a sales partner who's actually just doing that, doing the deals and making sure you don't only earn your producer's fee or even not even, or maybe even not your overheads out of production, but you actually have a, get a, get a part of the cake. So that's all collective bargaining in a way, on the one hand, and the other hand also p partnering and, 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 and the only asset that we have is, is, is the content, as I said. Michael, what's your, your yeah, I was just thinking, I, I mean, to me, one of the problems is that we know the rights, but we don't really know the value of those rights. And since mm -hmm. some people want all the rights, I don't know if they're the right people to handle those rights. Yeah. So it's really, it's a really yeah. trick question of what are those rights really worth yeah, yeah. in the future? And how do we best handle them to give up all the partners the best position? And that's a really hard game because we don't really know what they were. I mean, the the times you rewrite those contracts today, mm -hmm. they're always new positions. Okay, and you have a hold back there. And, you know, I mean, it's very, very difficult. And I think we need to find some kind of model that works for handling those rights. You know? mm. I mean, does that make sense? It's just very complicated because so, uh, you, everybody wants to aggregate the rights, but I sometimes feel is that the 
best aggregator of rights, but who, how do we get the maximum value of those rights? In what position? Right. Um, any other questions? We have a gentleman here. Thanks. My name is Nicolas Parpex, and I represent a French uh, financial institution. And uh, the question is this. You've mentioned that the market demands higher quality programs, and that means higher costs, and therefore the, the need for a larger number of uh, partners and co-producers, which is uh, hurting your back end, uh, the back end of the original producer. Um, Philip and, and Michael, does that also mean that perhaps uh, independent production companies uh, will consolidate in the future? Do you foresee consolidations and mergers in the production landscape in the years to come? Well, I was just consolidated, so yes, that's <laughs> that would be the answer to that. Um, I don't, I won't, I mean, I don't think it's going to hurt the, the back end, the the um, you know the co-production model. I think it. it in the end, it's probably going to enhance it because I think we'll reach a bigger uh, audience. Uh, there are a lot of challenges with co-production because it's it is it's easy to talk about co-production. In the end, you can kill kill by notes or by cultural differences or they don't want this talent. And but but you know we need to figure it out because I I mean coming from a small country, we need to qu keep the quality going. We need to have co-production. I think the bigger countries have probably an easier time handling you know the financing uh, but going back to what Philip says I think in the end you know when creative people need access to that money to the development money and to the structure and I think that to me it's been very interesting to see how important the sales companies are and the, the people tr you know pre-selling you know, stuff so I think that independent companies either have to will be um, going into bigger structures or have to find their own stronger partners in, a, in the vertical chain up because it's really hard to, to be o alone and find the money. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid we, um, uh, we can't take any more questions. We've, we've sort of run out of time. Um, we will be outside the auditorium after, so please, if you want to come and continue the discussion with us, we're very happy to do that. Um, briefly, I want to obviously thank my colleagues here. Um, and just sort of sum up, I think um, Amadine's presentation earlier was very succinct. Traditional TV continues to grow, uh, even though we're in a new era of connected content. Local content is king. Uh, success of local shows leads to international recognition. A-list talent and bold dramas will pay off. Traditional key players and new market entrants can coexist. There is a world of opportunity. Welcome to the new El Dorado. Thank you very much. Thank you.